Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff, and in this video, we're going to be discussing a novel exercise, and there's a paper about it we'll see in a minute. And this exercise is called the flexed elbow or bent elbow wall slide. And we'll see in just a little bit that it can be used to correct for impaired scapular mechanics in individuals with a shoulder pathology. So how many times have you been working in the clinic and you have a patient come in and you have them lift their shoulder up and you see this? this significant scapular compensation. What do you do about it? Well, we're about to find out. Now, what conditions might you see where somebody is exhibiting poor scapular mechanics upon shoulder elevation? In particular, this shoulder hike. Well, you can see some examples here. For example, a rotator cuff tear. Subacromial impingement syndrome. Now, generally with impingement syndrome, the impaired scapular mechanics are a lot more subtle. You may have somebody where there's absolutely no shoulder hike or it's very minimal. It would take somebody trained to look for this to actually see it. Um, but there tends to be impaired scapular mechanics with subacromial impingement syndrome. And you might have some cases where to get to that very end range, there's some of that shoulder hike. Adhesive capsulitis, a.k.a. frozen shoulder, and then various shoulder post-operative rehabs, total shoulders, reverse total shoulders, um, rotator cuff repairs, etc., etc. You can have the shoulder hike and impaired scapular mechanics with any of these and possibly more. Now, the phrase poor scapular mechanics is an umbrella phrase. It encompasses a wide array of presentations, and some of them I have listed here. I'm going to read these out. Number one, shoulder hiking during abduction and or flexion range of motion. That can also occur during scaption, but it's just usually more pronounced with abduction and flexion. Number two, weakness of the middle and or lower traps. So oftentimes after an injury or with gradual weakening of the shoulder or a post-operative repair of some kind, the middle and lower traps, and I didn't mention it here, but also the serratus anterior, they get weak. Really all the muscles get weak, even the upper traps to some extent. But remember, when you upwardly rotate the scapula, which is what happens during shoulder elevation, there's a force couple that occurs between three major muscles of the shoulder girdle. Those are, one, the upper traps, two, the lower traps, and three, the serratus anterior. Those are your three primary upward rotators of the scapula. And in particular, if the lower traps and serratus anterior are weak, that really just puts a huge reliance on the upper traps. And even if the upper traps are weak, what you're going to observe is not just upward rotation, but this scapular elevation. Because remember, the upper traps, their other function is scapular elevation. And that's why you see that shoulder hiking when that force couple is not working for whatever reason. And perhaps it's due to weakness of some of those muscles. And then number three, excessive use of the upper traps relative to the middle and lower traps. So that would imply more of a motor control issue. So maybe they have strength in the middle and lower traps and they should theoretically be able to do this movement without compensation, but they're just not aware of how to do it, how to coordinate those muscles to function in a way that eliminates that shoulder hike or any other impaired scapular mechanic presentations. Now, the vast majority of the time, with the possible exception of impingement syndrome, it's not just a motor control issue in isolation, it's also that the muscles themselves are weak. So what do you do? You might go after strengthening exercises of the serratus anterior, the middle traps, and the lower traps, right? Maybe try stretching the upper traps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what inevitably happens is they usually have a hard time gaining strength in those muscles. They do gain strength, but it's usually pretty slow. And then even once they do regain total strength, a lot of times they still have that scapular compensation. So there's several problems with some of these exercises that are just directly targeting those muscles. So most scapular exercises do not incorporate shoulder elevation into the movement. So if you're talking about standard rows or face pull rows or horizontal abduction type of movements, those are not incorporating shoulder elevation into the movement. That doesn't mean they're inherently bad exercises. And I would still give a lot of these and others because we want to get those muscles stronger, but they're not incorporating shoulder elevation into the movement. And so they're not helping to regain that motor control. Well, then let's do an exercise that does incorporate those, like serratus wall slides, banded overhead presses, or banded snow angels. And the problem with these is that even though they are incorporating shoulder elevation into the movement, 
they're not minimizing the activity of the upper traps and they're not maximizing the activity of the middle and lower traps. So they're not helping to regain that force couple as much as we would like to. So understand, I'm not dissing these exercises. They're excellent exercises. I give them all the time. But what happens when you're doing these types of exercises and you're just not able to correct that person's scapular compensation? What do you do? Well, fortunately, there is a paper that investigated this. So here's the paper that this was all based on. Bending the elbow during shoulder flexion facilitates greater scapular upward rotation and a more favorable scapular muscle activation pattern. Here's the logic behind it all. Another approach to increase scapular muscle activation as well as to promote greater scapular upward rotation is to limit glenohumeral joint excursion during motion of the entire shoulder complex. Given that shoulder movement occurs simultaneously at the sternoclavicular, scapulothoracic, so the scapula, and glenohumeral articulations, restricting movement of the glenohumeral joint may lead to compensatory increased scapulothoracic movement with an associated increased activation of the scapular upward rotators. Bending the elbow during shoulder flexion is one way of restricting glenohumeral motion, presumably due to passive insufficiency of the triceps brachii. So here is the triceps brachii muscle, and the elbow is straight here. Now, if the elbow were to be bent or flexed, the tricep muscle would be stretched. Now, recall that the triceps brachii has three heads, a lateral head, a medial head, and then the long head, which is a two-joint head that crosses the shoulder joint. So additionally, if we were to bend the elbow and begin elevating the shoulder in front of us, let's say in shoulder flexion, that's going to put an additional stretch, particularly on the long head. So this idea of bending the elbow and then lifting the arm up with the elbow bent is putting the triceps brachii on passive insufficiency, and that is going to dramatically limit glenohumeral joint excursion. Furthermore, the attachment of the long head of the triceps to the inferior glenohumeral capsule may further limit glenohumeral joint excursion when the elbow is fully bent. Now what you're seeing right here is shoulder flexion up to about 120 degrees and a comparison between that with the elbow fully extended and that with the elbow fully flexed, which is what they were investigating in this paper. Now, to quench all the anticipation, before we get to the actual exercise and how to do it, let's look at the results so we know what we're going for. This is a really well done table. We have all the muscles on the left side and know that their values were expressed as percent MVIC, maximal volitional isometric contraction. And those are in order serratus anterior, upper traps, middle traps, and lower traps. And then we have their activation, either with the elbow extended, EE, or elbow flexed EF. Now what you see here is that the serratus anterior actually got significantly more activation when the elbow was flexed. And when I say significant, I am talking about statistical significance because the p-value is less than 0.01. If we look at the upper traps, notice when the elbow's flexed, they have significantly less activation than when we do it with the elbow extended, which is our typical way that we measure shoulder flexion. Those are two big statistically significant results. We get much better serratus anterior activation and much less upper trap activation with the elbow flexed. Now when we compare the middle traps and lower traps, there is no significant difference between that with the elbow extended and elbow flexed. However, if we look, let's say, at the upper trap to serratus anterior activation ratio, which we want lower because we want less upper trap activation, when the elbow is flexed, it's only 0.21, whereas with the elbow extended, it's 0.96. So that ratio is absolutely optimized with the elbow bent or elbow flex wall slide, and that was a statistically significant difference. 
What we also see is that the upper trap to lower trap activation ratio is actually pretty high with the elbow extended 2.16 with the elbow flexed, it's 1.18. Now, they were using a, an alpha value of 0.05, and for that last one, the p-value is 0.06. So not quite significant according to the statistical analysis, but that's still pretty good. We are optimizing the upper trap to lower trap activation ratio, which we want as low as possible. Now to perform this exercise, we need two things. Number one, we need a wall. And you can technically perform this exercise just in the air. However, having your elbow track up and down the wall helps to better control the range of motion and make the movement more controlled so you can better isolate the middle and lower trapezius muscles. The second thing we're gonna need is a bag, a pillowcase, something to cover the elbow with so the elbow has less friction and it's not painful when you're sliding the elbow up and down the wall. Because Some walls might be a little rougher than others. Now, before I show you on this arm here, I'm gonna show you on my right side, just so you can see my hand. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put our hand on the back of our neck. If you don't have that range of motion or the person you're dealing with does not, they can put it on the back of their head, but wherever you put that hand, those fingers need to stay in that position the entire time. The fingers don't slide up and down. The, wherever you place those fingers, that's where they stay for the duration of this exercise, okay? So what I'm gonna do here, using my left arm, I'm gonna put my hand on the back of my neck. Those fingers are not gonna change position. And I'm gonna start with my elbow down here. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to lift it up, press up as much as I can, and then come back down. And I'm just gonna repeat that. Lift up as much as you can, and then come back down. And if you look, you should see my scapula elevating as I come up to the top and then come back down. Now what we've been doing in the clinic with patients is having them do this continuously for about one minute, maybe two to three second holds at the top and repeating and then doing anywhere between two and three sets of that movement, and then we retest. And the retest is shoulder flexion. Now the only issue that I have with this paper is that they only investigated this in the flexion direction. And they definitely got some good promising results for that. They did not look at this, however, in the abduction direction. So what do you do if you need to fix scapular mechanics in that direction? Well, you can certainly try doing the exercise in the flexion direction as they've done in this paper. But fortunately, we've been playing around with this exercise in the clinic and we've come up with an abduction-based variation for the same exercise. Take a look. What do you do about shoulder abduction? Well, we've tested this a little bit in the clinic and got some decent results on this. So instead of facing the wall, now we're gonna stand 90 degrees to it and it's gonna be the same idea. We're gonna have the fingers behind the head or the neck here, depending, and then we're going to keep the fingers there. I'm gonna have my elbow on the wall, starting at the bottom here, and then we're going to lift up as much as we can, two to three second holds there, and then we're gonna do that continuously for about a minute and do anywhere between two and three sets of that. And then of course we would retest. And for that, the retest would be shoulder abduction. And again, we would hope to see any of the three things, possibly a combination, that would be a decrease in pain, increased range of motion overall, or less of that scapular compensation, again, that we see with a lot of shoulder conditions. Now, I think one important thing to understand here is who is the exact patient population that you're gonna use this exercise on? Well, we already talked about for rotator cuff tears, for impingement syndrome, for adhesive capsulitis, but we need to make sure that the issue is specifically with the scapular mechanics. Because if you have somebody that comes in and you have them lift their arm up and they only get to about 160, but you're not really seeing or feeling any significant issue with scapular mechanics, it could just be that their thoracic extension is limited, or maybe there's a little bit of impaired joint play at the glenohumeral joint. You need to do some joint mobilizations. If you try this exercise for 
people with those particular issues, you're probably not going to see a positive effect. If you determine that it's due to thoracic extension mobility, then you need to do thoracic extension mobilization exercises, okay? whether that's with a band or manually or even through manipulation. Instead, this exercise is specifically for patients who have difficulty elevating their arm in the first place or when they do and they're getting near end range, you're seeing specifically that scapular compensation. So I'll give you two examples here. We have one guy in the clinic who's pretty far along on a rotator cuff repair, and he almost has full range of motion for shoulder flexion, but what you typically see when he does this is he's able to lift up and then right at the end, about 150 degrees, he gets this scapular compensation. So we did this exercise on him, and we retested range of motion, and he was able to get about five degrees higher, and also with significantly less scapular compensation. I would say the most impressive case we had is a guy with a full-on rotator cuff tear. And it wasn't a repair, it's just conservative care. This guy came into the clinic one day with about 50 degrees of shoulder flexion. He was basically right here. He could not get the arm up past there. We did this exercise and we retested and had him lift the arm up and he's lifting up and he's like, what in the world? And he was actually able to get up to about 160 degrees, from about 50 to 160 degrees just with this one exercise. Now, I'm not making any guarantees with this, but that demonstrates two things. One, you can use this on individuals who have a full-on rotator cuff tear and they have very impaired shoulder elevation. The second thing that this demonstrates is that this patient probably needs scapular strengthening. Remember that this exercise maximizes the activity of serratus anterior, middle, and lower traps without significant activation of the upper traps. So this exercise should certainly be a part of his plan of care. And we can even add resistance onto this once it gets a little bit easier for him uh, to challenge these muscles even more. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the bent elbow or flexed elbow wall slide and how you can incorporate this into the plan of care of patients who are having difficulty overcoming that scapular compensation or even use it early on in their rehab. Please make sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit that notification button for notifications for all videos in the future. Thank you so much.